anything for pairing. Okay, it's a 20 second lag, so I'll let you know when to go ahead. How many people are out there? Wait a second. Okay. Go ahead, Mac. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining our live stream. Our, it's a Haitian Times community conversation special. For those who followed the Haitian Times for a while, you know that we've done these quite often, especially during the pandemic. And we have this community conversations because we want to go out there and engage with our community in all the ways that are possible. And so Vilas and I had been talking about having a community conversation for Haitians in Ohio because we had seen the stories about you know, Haitians getting beat up, right? We've heard people who are leaving Long Island, for example, to move to Ohio, Springfield in particular. And so unfortunately, after we planned this event, we had the, um, the, the terrible racist comments that were spewed on Twitter and national TV during the debate stage. And that just really escalated things for everyone. Um, we would have loved to have this in person, but unfortunately, because of the security risk, we had to cancel the in-person plans we had and only hold this virtually. And so I thank you, Viles, so much for being so accommodating. I'm sorry that it's come to this and that you and the community have had such a rough time over the past week or so in particular, dealing with these racist comments and just vilification of Haitians. So I'll leave it to you um, for now to say a few words and then we'll kick off and introduce everyone who's on our panel today to have a conversation that um, you know we hope will help the community in Springfield and Haitians in general feel like they're not alone, that they're supported that they have um, people who are watching out for them. And we hope that this will be one of many conversations we'll be able to have with Haitians in Springfield. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us and show us your solidarity. And um, I think that we're gonna spend a good time together. And I think that the end result of it will show uh, the Haitians community in Springfield that um, we stand with them no matter where we are. And uh, we welcome you and we thank you for your kind word, words, your prayers and everything. And we are so happy to be here. And I will just say, may the Lord God, the creator of all universe, give us all the wisdom that we deserve just to spend this time with humility and grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So today I'm actually going to open up with um, some of the people who've been living in Springfield for a while to share what some of the experiences um, have been like for them. You know, they'll share a little bit about why they moved here um, to Springfield, what it's been like for their families and how some of the anti-immigrant, anti-Haitian sentiment in particular has um affected their their lives and their livelihoods in the past uh, few weeks or months. So I see JD here. I'd like him to come on and share his experience for a few minutes. If you can help us do that, Sherelle. JD. All right, so if he's not available to speak, then I'm going to ask Ms. Philomen to come up and share your experience, if that's okay. Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay, we hear you now. Yes, yeah, so I, I, we don't need videos right now, right? Not if you don't feel secure about sharing your video, audio. Okay. 
Well, my name is James, James Dennis. I'm a Haitian immigrant living in Springfield, Ohio. Uh, I've moved to Springfield five years. And um, I have a wife and two kids. And uh, I work in my own businesses. I, I invest in real estate. We own uh, three properties in Springfield. And I have a photography studio. So, uh, and I work as a, a mechatronic technician for Amazon. Uh, so that's that's about it. And what are the questions you guys have? So JD, when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you shared how you were really becoming afraid after we had the white supremacists attend one of the Springfield Commission um, city meetings. So if you could just take us back to that time and how things have changed or or not for you in terms of what you feeling seeing people vilify Haitians like that, that would be helpful. Oh yeah, I mean as you all can can see it's pure hatred. They hate us. And um and the video that went viral is the lady is not even Haitian. She, she's a US citizen dealing with men, mental health issues. You know, uh but because she she was black, uh, they label her as as Haitian immigrant eating cats. You know, um, I know, I know that uh, Haitians are causing a lot of accidents in in in, uh, in Springfield, but I feel like sometimes they are being being targeted, and um, I I don't know if you know about a radio radio scanner. They have, they can hear when uh, if if you call the cops and the cops are talking, they can they can hear that, and uh, anytime they hear uh an accident and it's and the, the cops say there is a language barrier. Uh, they go on the scene and film, and take videos, right. and post online, what what are, what the Haitians are doing. But it's not just Haitians. Uh, you know, driving bad in in Springfield. You know, Springfield has a lot of issues, and and it's sad that they they put everything on Haitian immigrant. You know, if if you if you watch the news, if you you know, you look up the stats. Uh, Springfield has a drugs problem. You know, homeless everywhere. You know, it, it, it's it, the crime because Springfield is one of the most dangerous city in the in the, in the U United States. So Haitians are not doing those things. You know, uh, but they they just take all the issues and then blame it on Haitians immigrant. Uh, so you know, with the bomb threats and everything that is going on. Uh, Haitians are not safe in, in Springfield anymore. So, um, you know, um, I don't, I don't usually go out. I order everything online. I don't, I don't go to Walmart and just the shoppings, but uh, I, I take my kids to the park and then, and then I like biking. I, I cannot do that anymore. You know, I have to just uh, stay home and just, just don't go out. We used to just go for a walk in the neighborhood but um, we we cannot do that anymore. And then my wife is thinking about moving out of the city, which makes it very hard for me because my properties, I'm the handyman. I got to do everything in the properties. So if we move out, uh, if anything, yeah. drive to Springfield and uh, I have a studio, I have a three-year lease with the studio. It's just, yeah. it's just right now and then thinking what, what should I do as a as a leader mm -hmm. of my family, and how can we how can we fix how can we fix that? But um, I, I recently, like an hour ago, uh, at a speedway, there was a protest against Haitian. Mm. You know, I had to just post some things so the Haitians can avoid avoid that area. So it's 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 getting uh it's it's crazy right now in Springfield. Did you actually see this protest? You said you posted about it, or you heard about it? Uh, I heard about it. I mean, uh, second, I mean, a uh, uh, watch crime group they have. So okay. they 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 post stuff like that, and post pictures so I can I can see. Uh, that's that that's why. Um, I don't know. I hope I was not in that group seeing those comments about they saying if if you guys are serious 
uh, uh, the cops should be like uh, having to deal with bodies of Haitian blood, blood bodies of Haitians. Yeah. So yeah, and they are saying uh, you have guns. Why waiting on the government to do something? So it's 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 a lot of issues, and and we need to fix it in Springfield. And right now, right now, I I just I keep I uh, I kept on thinking I I don't know how to move on from that, and it's it, it's crazy. Oh my gosh! Oh my. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank, thanks so much. I'm sorry that you're dealing with all of this. This is heartbreaking, and I think that's why everyone is so concerned and why we've had to change this conversation to the immediate threat. And obviously, as you can see, we're here in a small room um and like i said it's just we can't guarantee anyone's safety the police can't guarantee anyone's safety so this is a real problem a real threat right um you did mention the the driving situation with with haitians and crime and different activities in springfield there was one in particular that has been used um you know many times to i guess justify the reasons that yeah. people are targeting Haitian drivers and following folks around. Can you talk a little bit, Vilas, give us some background about how what happened last year when um, the 11 year old boy was killed in that terrible accident? And if that's when you felt the shift um, yeah. necessarily. Yeah, and it, it, it was like um, when last year, I think it might be like, um, I, I, I don't recall the, the, the exact time, but it was after the, the school bus accident that everything started to escalate to that level. Mm -hmm. And um, and they normally started just to see, to take that situation um, and, and build up on it mm -hmm. and make all bad comments on, on Haitians. But Haitians don't have anything, Haitians don't have anything to do with crimes. All that we believe is that we are more criticized for the bad driving that I think that the city is working on now. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, we are we are good to go. And I am so sorry, my friend, that you have to go through all of this. And I think that our office is open just to welcome people like you and to listen to and see if we can move on together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, Vilas, I didn't share the name, the full name of the center. Can you tell folks again what it is that you do here and why you felt it was necessary to actually have a center like this um, available for the community? Yeah, Haitian Community Help and Support Center is a center that is set up here just to give orientation to Haitian in Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, and giving them the services that they need when it comes to applying for legal papers or uh, job search or housing. And also we are implementing projects that have to do with cross-cultural education by the fact that we want that the Americans learn from us who we are as a people. And also we implemented Creole courses for Americans who would like to uh, speak Creole, and at the same time, we are educating um our people, the Haitian people, to understand the American culture, and giving some driving classes and ES ESL class English as a second language to make sure that um people know exactly what to do to respect the law, mm -hmm. and and the other thing um, that we want to be there for them uh, to tell them which route to take if they want to buy cars or anything because yeah. they have taken advantage of them a lot by the fact that they do not know the the culture. Mm -hmm. So we are here even before they do something that they can come to us and explain to them what is the procedures just for people not to take advantage of them. Right. Just before this um, past few weeks, we were talking about the home ownership seminars that you hold for folks who are um, now able and want to start buying homes, obviously we've had to put, you've had to put that second or last seminar on hold to deal with this immediate threat. So um, tell us just a little bit more, if you will, about 
how Haitians who've been here, even though it's been a relatively short amount of time, are actually doing well and how that might play into some of the animus that we're seeing. And it, it's it's very true by the fact that Haitians are hardworking people. They will work more than 60 hours a week if they get a possibility to do that. Because of that, they have been integrating the, the community so rapidly mm -hmm. that kind of normally brings some kind of jealousy because they buy houses. We have business owners here. Uh, uh, we have the little ways of business not here. Yeah. And we have um, folks buying homes and opening restaurants and, and everything. And the thing is, you would see if there is um, Haitians are buying the most recent cars. I mean, the Toyota right. 2020 for oh, brand new okay. cars. And they paying their mortgage on time. They paying their rent on time. And they paying their credit card on time. And normally they interfere. They, they are in every part of the city. You mm -hmm. go to the hospital, you find them. You go to school, you find them. You go to Clark County services, jobs and family services, you find them. So um, find them working there working or? yes Social working services. working actually as professionals as professionals okay. yeah. yes mm -hmm. and um uh so they are at all levels of life mm -hmm. and normally they do not choose to stay only in one place in the city they are all over the cities and uh, they are in the north and east uh, uh west uh, so they are everywhere mm -hmm. and um and i think that um and they work hard and apart from the bad driving that we have been criticized of um and i i think that we're working toward a solution of that um otherwise i think that the haitians have been doing well very well here mm -hmm. and for those who don't know we're talking about anywhere between twelve thousand to fifteen thousand or fifteen thousand to twenty thousand every time i turn around i get a different number yeah, yeah. um uh, we we do not have an official statistics actually but mm -hmm. the, the the city officials speak of um fifteen to twenty thousand mm -hmm. and to my experience i think that this figure is exact mm -hmm. by the fact that we have a lot of haitians here and we have been normally yeah um working with them and they all lot here mm -hmm. yeah I'm telling you, just from driving around today, it's my first time ever in Springfield. Mm -hmm. I can see what you're talking about. Yeah, you they're everywhere. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we met, um, we went into a store that just opened maybe eight months ago. Yes. Um, La Bendita Groceries and Food Market. And the activity there was wonderful. People were coming in to buy, you know, uh, Haitian bread, cassav, um, to make money transfers and things like that. So you can tell and see um the 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 change that's happening where folks are putting in businesses in places where they had been abandoned churches and things like that so and, it, and it's like this everywhere you go to walmart it's the same thing you go yeah. to Kroger, it's it's the same thing you go to the mexican businesses the same thing you go to the haitian businesses it's, it's the same thing so uh, we and i we there is a mix latinos opening new businesses in the area not only haitian because they see that there is like um a very good market in here mm -hmm. because of the presence of the Haitian and they come and open businesses. So I think that at the end of the day, they will finish to realize that we are here just to contribute to uh, to boost the economy of, of the mm -hmm. community, to work and to make sure that we have a very vibrant and diversified uh, community. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Um, we we're also at Rose Goutte restaurant, and I'm telling you, the yes. line was almost at the door. Yes. Even despite all of the, the fear and anxiety people have, folks are still going about their business and enjoying the Haitian food, buying things at Adasa Market and all of that. The parking lot was full of activity. Yes. So just like we do, we're resilient. We keep going, right? We don't just go off no. and hide yeah. somewhere. And it was good to see not only Haitians, um, but I'm buying food at was yes. there, but mm -hmm. you know you had white people, black folks inside that business as well. So just to give folks an understanding of what it's like um, here, yes, mm -hmm. there's fear, but people are also just trying to, you know, wake up and keep going, go shopping, um, have their groceries um, taken care of and whatnot. Right, I'd like to bring up. Miss Philomen, who's one of these uh, business owners here in Springfield, yes. who's uh, 
felt the need to actually come up and work here to support around, the community. You can come around and okay. see my place. Yeah, let's bring her in. Yes, I got a yeah. lady first. So yeah. I'm going to have her chat. Come on and take a seat with me. Yeah. Um, ideally, we'd have a mic in person and be able to go around, but this is what we have to do for, for safety reasons. So tell us, Ms. Willamette, introduce yourselves for everyone. Tell us about what brought you to Springfield. Uh, number one, I say hi to you. Good afternoon. And I really happy my pleasure to come here to support the Haitian community here in Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, like you say, my name is Philomene. Philistine, I am the with the creation market, mental services. Um, I think I'm here almost two years. I brought me here because when I heard I have a lot of my people here. And then um well you're in Florida. Yeah. Yep. They need yeah. they have they have need here. So and I have my business down there. And then um my brother have moving first and I decide just to come here and then to do a business also mm -hmm. and be involved with the the church here. Um involving the Haitian community. Mm -hmm. And since I moved here, I remember the first place I introduced myself to the city hall. And I went there and then I introduced myself to them and I tell them what I usually do in my city. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of little well known in my city, especially in the activity they're doing mm -hmm. when they have an election because I used to have and still have a large youth and I'm director of the large youth. I also have a nonprofit organization too since mm -hmm. 2010 so it's been like for me i think coming here i come to help because whatever little knowledge i have little experience i have i will really share it with my people here mm -hmm. and like pastor Villes was saying and i think me and uh mdl we i was the one they may 18 for the first time mm -hmm. he would make story and that was that was beautiful so we tried to collect all the haitian together and instant boom, and I heard all those news happen now. Mm -hmm. All those bad things I heard about the Haitian, all those things I heard is really painful, is hurt, is really stress out, especially for the young kids, mm -hmm. the one who's in school now, and is very hurt. Yeah. To hear all those things I heard now. Yeah, no, we've spoken to a few people who said the kids, the teens in particular, are being bullied at school. And um, Sophia, I'll have you chat a little bit about that later to give an example of how that played out this week um, with one of the people you support. But um, Philomene, can you chat a little bit, tell folks how this is also affecting your business where you're facing different threats I am as well? Actually, I think I may come back to the news again because I'm just watching something very close for this week coming. So if that's so, so I will put my voice more out there about the situation mm -hmm. and for me i'm thinking it's all about risk so maybe some people maybe, yes mm -hmm. maybe some people maybe denied it so for me i think all that jealousy and all including why i can say that um like we come here we're not bothering no one i know they maybe have a little complaint about the haitian driving without license everything like that myself i remember um when there was first accident was happened, I went to the city in the meeting mm -hmm. and with the all those um, official elected was there, the commissioner, everything like that. And I tell them, if you know they don't have a license, just do not sell them a car. Mm. And we was talking like how they can help them, especially when they go into the sign, the wrong way, you know, everything like that. I tell them, put, put it in Creole. I was impressed mm. I put it in Creole, say, um, they can know when they have to make a wrong way or whatever. So, mm -hmm. and also I tell them to do a class for the Creole, make a book in Creole mm -hmm. before they went for the test so they can, you know, learn so something better. Thing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. therefore, we was talking about all those things. Um, like I say, my, my people so ambitious, let's put it that way. It's not like ambitious to stealing everything like that, just mm -hmm. to work. Mm -hmm. because um, for them, eight hour job is not enough for them. You see, mm -hmm. when you tell them, I used to have my employer, if the business is going slow, I can say, okay, I cut it off. You can see they have a stress already on the face because they don't want no hour to cut off. Mm -hmm. So therefore, 
And I was telling them all those things can help the Haitian community because I used to live in Florida for years. And then since I come to this country, I've been living in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I see people and I talk to people and I see a lot. And then so therefore, I always give them some advice, give mm -hmm. them some little experience. I have been in this country for years. So it's, it's kind of like Haitian creation market. We do a part. Mm -hmm. I always have a group, a large of customer. Every time they walk in, I always tell them, talk to them, what to do, what to not do, what to avoid, what, you know, everything like that, little discipline for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when they don't have a car, so it's so hard for them. They want to walk. They don't have a car. You can't get to work. You can yeah. get to work. Number yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Number two. When they don't have a license, and some some of them have a little license coming from international mm. license, do they take a risk on just job with those kind of mm -hmm. license? You understand? Mm -hmm. So I don't think that the job left try to kill someone. Mm -hmm. For me, I think they want to walk, mm -hmm. so they don't have a way to walk, so they have to do that. Maybe some of them. I remember I was asking that if somebody don't have a license, if you can buy a car. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the um one the one of the leaders on mm -hmm. the city was telling me yes they can buy a car, and they can buy a car with the auntie with the uncle or whatever. Mm -hmm. For me, I think if they don't have a license, they buy a car. The first thing they're gonna have in the market drop the car. So if you need to go shopping for your family for your children, you wanna go to work. Mm -hmm. So the car is still there. You're gonna take a chance to drive to drive the car. Yeah. So the solution is just if it, if you feel like you don't they don't have a license, mm -hmm. do not take advantage of them. Just don't sell them the car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that will one problem with result. I understand. And beside that again, um, about the people I heard last going on about the accident was happening, everything I think all those things is a politic. Mm -hmm. They take every, all those things they've been talking about, the Haitian immigrants, mm -hmm. is politic. Mm -hmm. So, and what I say all to the other news, if somebody want to really do a good politic, you need to get to Haitian community. You need to get to immigrate to get a good politic. Don't try <laughs> okay. to put them down, you know? Yeah, no, I <laughs> You need to you. work together. No, I hear you, Philomene. I think what you're referring to is the fact that we are a growing community with voting power, right? There's exactly. 1.5 million of us in the country born here or um, My state, Haiti, have... but naturalized. Yeah. And so now we're looking at an estimated 753,000 people of Haitian ancestry who can vote, right? Granted, the majority are in Florida, but I think you're right. You know, the earlier you get in with the Haitians, the better potentially to get the votes later on. Tell you something, as yeah. you know, as, uh, as uh, um, youth leaders, mm -hmm. and I may have some people from Florida that may be watching me because they keep calling me. They know what can I do? Yeah. They know what should I do? What can I do to help me? Mm -hmm. Because I usually get all my youth knock door to door, mm -hmm. bring people out to go vote. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of motivation yeah. to force people to, to mobilize them, them. To, yeah. to make them to, to vote. Mm -hmm. So I'm a US citizen myself, all my kids, mm -hmm. born here, mm -hmm. and all of them can vote. And we yeah. always vote. Okay. And I have Let, all the Haitian put, yeah. people too. <laughs> let's put a pin in that one. We'll talk about that mm -hmm. a little bit more later. Right now, I'd like to bring on, James, I know you wanted to say one more thing, but um, I'm not sure we'll have time if you could save it for later. I'd like to bring on Dr. Um, Sharon Wright Austin, who's a University of Florida political science professor. She teaches African American history and has a class um, called, I think, Haitian Americans in, in politics. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Austin. So if you wouldn't mind, um, please come on and share with us your scholarly perspective on what um, Philomene and, you know, Viles, what JD have been talking about here to help us all, you know, understand like where we are in this moment in history, as far as racism in America, which keeps coming up over and over again, and where we as immigrants, black immigrants, Haitian, black Haitian immigrants fit into, uh, into this narrative, please. Hi, everybody. All of a sudden now the sun is kind of got a glare on my face. I could see fine. So I'm trying to Slide around in my chair, so I won't have that glare. 
Okay. All right, but um, I hope I can share my screen because I did want to just talk a little bit briefly. Um, in, in the interest of time, uh, this is only ten slides. I hope y'all can see that. Okay, let me slide this out of the way. Can everybody see that? Yes, I see. Okay, it. so it's this is a lecture that we I'm teaching an African American politics class, and this is a lecture that we just had in class Tuesday, and a lot of students weren't really all that familiar. I say about half the class was familiar with what was happening in Springfield, but a lot of them hadn't heard of it. And I remember telling them, if you haven't heard of what happened and what J.D. Vance said, this was before it even got even worse as the week progressed. I was telling them, um, I'm not going to tell you. I, I just would not say say what has been said. I said, well, just look it up on your own. But we were just having a discussion about Haitian politics in Florida. So I want to just go ahead and just, this tells you a little bit about me. Uh, I've been teaching at University of Florida since 2001, and I wrote a, one of the books that I've written was published in 2018. The title of it is here, The Caribbeanization of Black Politics. And it looks at politics in four cities, Boston, Chicago, Miami, and New York City. And it looks at just the impact of Black immigrants in these communities and the impact that it had on the African-Americans who were all, already there. Um, I got the idea to start uh, work on this book when I started teaching here at UF in 2001, because a lot of my students are Haitian uh, in my class, I would say probably about 30% of my class uh, is Haitian. I also teach a study abroad class, African-Americans in Paris, which is a spring break class. And I'd say about half of the students who go every year are Haitian. So I, um, because I learned so much from them over the years in my classes, um, that's when I decided to start doing research on Haitian politics, mostly looking uh, here in Florida. And I'm currently looking at a book on Black women in the presidency that I had started even before Kamala Harris had started um, running for president. It's called Say It to My Face, Black Women's Social Justice in the Presidency. So that tells you a little bit about me. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be brief. Uh, I'm not going to take up very much of your time because I know that you, you want to have a play in time uh, for Q&A. So these are the things that I'm going to be talking about. You can just uh, rice, you like chicken? Um, you can just... <laughs> Uh, look at this on your own. And the one question that I primarily want to look at is this one. Why are people so hostile in small towns and cities? Because a lot of the people in Springfield who are not really familiar with the way things are in America are kind of maybe taking this personally and thinking, wow, they hate us. They, but it's not just your group. This is something that's typical of the way uh, immigrants of color generally, but especially Black immigrants and especially Haitian immigrants uh, have been treated. So that's what I want to talk about uh, today. So this is something that I talk about in my book, The Caribbeanization of Black Politics, when um, the, I guess the largest uh, numbers of Haitians moving to the United States came in different waves or during different periods. And the thing is that mostly uh, Haitian immigrants in the past mostly settled into predominantly Black neighborhoods because you know many of them came during an era when black people when black people couldn't move into white neighborhoods so they mostly assimilated and moved into black neighborhoods attended their children attended schools with black children and when they came to america many of them you know of course all of them were very proud of their haitian heritage but some of them resented the idea that once they came to america they were the target of the one drop rule which is what it says basically that if you have one drop of black blood one drop of african bl blood you're black and so that meant that if, you know, if you look at people, you can't tell um, who's Haitian, who's who's not. Um, you just see people as being black. And so as a result, they had to deal with the same type of biases and prejudice and stereotypes that other black people who've been living in America had to deal with. But their problems were even worse in the sense that sometimes even the black people were mean to them. And that's one thing that my students have told me over the years, some of their worst experiences at times have not really even come from white people, but have come from black people who have all these really ugly stereotypes. So it wasn't until like the mid 1960s that you start, saw a lot of black immigrants coming because there were different types of quotas that were written in federal laws that specifically prohibited uh, people of African, Latin and Asian descent from being able to move here. It wasn't until this law um, right here in number one that was passed in 1965, the immigration and Naturalization Act that you began to see more black immigrants coming here, but there were still a lot of barriers for Haitian immigrants that were not there for other black immigrants, uh, especially here in Florida. And then in 1972, you began to see more immigrants coming here from Haiti. They were fleeing not only economic problems, but the political changes that were taking place there as well. 
Um, but nevertheless, they were thought of as economic refugees. So I don't know if you all have heard of the WIF with Dreyfus policy that says that, for example, if a person who's Cuban manages to reach dry land, that person can apply for an asylum and might possibly probably be able to stay. But if a pers person of Haitian descent reached dry land, that person was sent back. And it was like that for a very, very long time. Um, and so as a result, when you hear people talking about, oh, many Haitians are illegal, they're illegal immigrants. Well, first of all, we know that that's not true, especially not in Springfield. But also, if that is the case or was the case in the past, it was because they couldn't come here legally because of racist laws like this one that kept them out. They were perceived as economic refugees and not political refugees, even though many times they were fleeing political persecution, people saw them in that way. And that was really just an excuse that was given to not allow Haitians to uh, come to this country as other immigrants of color were. Um, and then, as you know, as many people in Springfield have temporary protected status, during the Obama administration, after the earthquake in 2010, um, he expanded the temporary protection status. So really for the first time, a lot of Haitians had that status, which meant that if they were in this country uh, by a certain period of time, they could apply for an asylum. Uh, they wouldn't have the risk of being sent back. They can be given a, you know, a an opportunity to stay. And that was later expanded just recently um, from uh, August 24th of, of this year to February 3rd um, of 2026. So that means you can apply for a work permit. You can basically live your life. You can uh, not have the fear of deportation. The problem is with this upcoming election, we don't know what's going to happen because you've been hearing what Donald Trump has been saying. If he gets elected, um, he's already said, I'm going to deport all of them. Now, we don't know if that's true or not, but he definitely is probably going to have a problem with the temporary protected status, especially for Haitians. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of when Haitians uh, have moved to this country. And there has always been a lot of prejudice and resentment toward Haitian immigrants um, during the 1980s because we didn't know a whole lot about AIDS and where it came from. Um, Haitians and some Black Africans as well were perceived as being AIDS carriers, and they were thought to be from a group that was more likely to have whatever the virus was that caused AIDS. So as a result, the Food and Drug Administration didn't allow them to donate blood, even if it was found that they didn't have AIDS, that they were completely he healthy, and that didn't change until 1990. So that was a problem. Um, job discrimination, especially in service industries in Florida, a lot of people felt uncomfortable, so they said, with having Haitian waiters and waitresses. And so as a result, and even like having someone who was Haitian working in a department store, some people said, well, we don't feel comfortable with that. So they were openly discriminated against. Um, and then also there's been political competition with African-Americans, which is what one of my books uh, talks about. But even with the members of the Congressional Black Caucus in Congress, um, some members of the Haitian community have had some serious issues with them because they felt like, you know, for the longest time, they didn't say anything about the problems that Black immigrants were facing. Um, and even now, I guess people feel that they are not doing enough. Um, and also they have moved into communities where Black people traditionally have been discriminated against. And then when Haitians uh, moved in, a lot of people resented that because they saw them as being job competition and political competition and educational competition as well. Even though they weren't, that's the way even some African-Americans uh, felt. So it isn't just white people, of course, you know, mostly, I guess, it's white people who have the hatred, but it's some Black people as well, as, as many of you probably know even better better than I do. But on a positive note, from my research, uh, and especially mostly focusing on the four cities that I mentioned, there is some solidarity with African Americans, especially when it comes to voting. Um, Haitians and African Americans do tend to vote for the same candidates, because they have common problems, especially when it comes to issues like you know, someone just mentioned police brutality is something that affects uh, Black men, regardless of what, you know, your background is. It affects all of us. So there are some common problems that we all face as Black people. And as a result, that's reflected in the way um, that Black people vote, regardless of whether they're Haitian or, or uh, African or whatever um, their um, descent is. Haitians have a tendency to vote at high rates. And as a result, as I just talked about in class recently, especially here in Florida, uh, there's been a m remarkable growth in the number of Haitian elected officials uh, locally and statewide and also now even uh, in Congress in, in more recent years. So now you're seeing the impact of immigrants who came here, their children sometimes being born here 
or maybe they or their children becoming naturalized citizens, they're now participating, they're now voting, their children have now become educated, running for office. And so now you're beginning to see that as someone just mentioned, Haitians have political power. And in Florida, I think you can see that there, even though I don't think there's enough respect for Haitian people, I think that politicians know that if you really wanna win an election, especially here in Florida, you really do have to appeal to Haitians. And so as a result, um, there are direct efforts to appeal to their votes from politicians. Um, and then also there are religious communities. Um, Haitians have founded their own churches and also um, the earliest Haitian immigrants sometimes benefited from attending different churches, especially African-American churches that helped them with some of the problems that they were experiencing. Um, I have a lot of Haitian students and have for quite some time uh, who've done extremely well in college. Um, they're able to, you know, to get a, a really good education here. Um, and one of the things on a positive note, I also want to say is that, as you know, there are places where you can go for help. And many of you know more about the local resources even uh, than I do. But I want to just, again, show you these, uh, and I'll end with that in a minute. But there are places you can go for help. So I guess the question is, why are people so hostile toward immigrants in small towns? Well, it's not just in small towns, even in cities. My students have told me over the years in Miami, many of them are from there, about how they've been treated even there. So even in cities is bad, but I think it's even worse in small towns because there are fewer black people in those towns. And many of the white people who live in those towns tend to be white working class, less educated, very conservative and basically very racist people who basically just don't like black people and don't want their communities to be diversified. They don't want people of color there. Um, and so, you know, but there are reasons why people settle in places like Springfield, because I was watching your mayor on CNN last night and he was talking about the fact that the city has a lot to offer and the people there um, are just trying to make a living and, and like just trying to take care of themselves and their families. But the workforce needs in small towns are high because those are places where people are less likely to want to live. If you had a choice between living in Columbus and living in Springfield, most people would say, I'd rather live in Columbus or I'd rather live in Cleveland. So as a result, there are certain jobs that are unfulfilled. And so when immigrants, when um, people say that, well, the immigrants are taking our jobs, well, no, that's not true. They are taking jobs that are abundantly available that in many cases, other people don't want. So there are a lot of benefits to living in these small towns, but scapegoating is the norm. Um, there's a really good documentary called Welcome to Shelbyville. I think you can find it on YouTube, but it talks about the impact of um, Somali immigrants in Shelbyville, Tennessee, which is probably a town similar to Springfield and the way that the community was able to re resolve all of the, the hostility that was directed at them. So what you're experiencing there is not uncommon. Um, it's it's I think it's been exacerbated and made worse by the fact that the former president and also one of your U.S. senators have made these ridiculous comments that are bigoted and racist, and that makes it even worse. But what you're dealing with there um, is not at all uncommon. So I will say that now in the, the age of cell phones, the good thing about it, when you are treated badly, you can always record it because, you know, pe Black people have been treated badly, badly throughout history, but now you have cell phones. Now there are surveillance cameras. So now things can go viral very quickly and you can make people aware of the hostilities that you're dealing with. So I would say document everything, you know, when people are saying things to you or if you feel that you've been discriminated against, make sure that you keep a record of that. If you're able to videotape it, make sure you definitely do that. Uh, and then if you don't have enough support groups, develop support groups because that's what immigrants um, have done as well. And also look outside of Ohio for help because you know, there are some resources in Ohio that I'm getting ready to show you, but um, you oftentimes have to cross state boundaries because you may not be able to get the kind of assistance that you need in Ohio, but you might be able to get it in Florida. You might be able to get it in South Florida, especially because they have such a large Haitian population there. So these are just some of the resources that, I mean, you know, I mentioned the Congressional Black Caucus, I didn't mean to insult them, but um, Hakeem Jeffries might just possibly in November become the first Black uh, Speaker of the House. This is his contact information. If you're having any problems and you want to reach out to the members of Congress, this is the information for the Congressional Black Caucus. The ACLU has filed several lawsuits challenging different types of voting and other types of civil rights discrimination. Um, the state of Ohio has a webpage where you can find information about attorneys who will represent you for free. 
um, if you have any type of civil rights issue. This is a group that I found out about the Haiti Bridge Alliance, but there are several others as well that um, brings attention to the plight of Haitians in America and, and comes up with different types of ways to assist them. Um, these are some other things. Uh, one of my students received one of these um, Soros fellowships years ago. She was Nigerian, but it's for new Americans, for uh, students who have been in this country for a brief period of time or who are the children of immigrants. Uh, they can get a fellowship for graduate school. This is also something um, that was established during the Obama administration, the New Americans Initiative, um, that is designed to try to help immigrants economically and in other ways. Um, I know you all are going to talk more about mental health, but if you're interested in just getting mental health in the state of Ohio, you may want to look at Ohio Mental Health Services. And then I have a son who's severely autistic, so I always think about people with special needs. But if you need services um, for special needs, this is something specifically in Ohio. Um, and so you and you also may want to contact the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. If you have someone um, who has, especially a developmental um, issue, um, you might want to look at that. So this is my information. Again, I'm at the University of Florida, Department of Political Science. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. And one thing that I want to leave you with, because I really feel horrible, I was even talking to one of my students the other day who's applying to law school and I'm writing her a recommendation. I apologize to her. And I'm like, I'm so sorry that you are having to deal with this kind of ignorance. Even though she doesn't live in Springfield, she is a woman of Haitian descent. Um, but just remember, I always try to find a biblical scripture whenever I'm going through something in life. So Genesis uh, chapter one, verse 26 says something that I hope you all will always remember. You are valuable because of who you are. You are made in God's image according to his likeness. So regardless of whoever you run into or somebody being ignorant or being hateful toward you, always keep in mind that you are valued here and there are many people in America who really appreciate and value your presence. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Austin. Yes. Um, that was so wonderful and comprehensive. It was a lot, but I think we're all feeling buoyed she by this. Speak fast and yes. speak right. <laughs> but there's a lot. And um, Philomene was just telling me that her daughter received one of these um, grants or fellowships from yeah, the from Obama, Obama Foundation. Yes. So, yes. you know, just to, to show like the Haitian excellence is, is endless in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I see... De Denise yes. is Denise, on the phone. Yeah, President yeah, Williams yes, is on yes. the phone. I was yes. going to bring her on, but um, maybe I can have Dr. Pierre Louis join really quickly. She's the one who's on the. Okay. Dr. Pierre Louis, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you. All okay. right. Yeah. I was yes. hoping. Um, you, you can tell us based on your research and um, all of the wonderful work that you've done on, I want to get this right, like Haitian international migration studies, Haitian transnationalism, and just Haitian Caribbean politics. You've been in New York and literally wrote the book on Haitians in New York. Um, and you're one of the most foremost people, experts on Haitians in America. What can you share about how this experience people like Philomene are having in Ohio? Like what's different or similar about the experiences people like, you know, my family has had on the coast, on the East Coast, in enclaves like New York, um, Miami, South Florida, and, um, and, and Boston. What's the same and what's slightly different that we can learn from that earlier experience of uh, the earlier generations? Thank you, Michael, for inviting me to the webinar. I think, the, uh, and thank you, Sharon. You really made, uh, provided a very deep analysis and comprehensive on, uh, understanding of the uh, issue that we face currently and then um, the uh, different support system that you mentioned. You know, there's, um, there has always been a history of um, anti-Haitian in the United States. Um, maybe some of the previous speakers uh, spoke about the fact that um, even Jefferson, in his writing, mentioned that um, the U.S. should never establish any kind of diplomatic relations with Haiti. So already in the Charter, the Constitution, in the framework of the United States, Haiti is a country, uh, Haitians' uh, population, 
that they should never deal with. And this came from the fact that um, a lot of the previous colons who were, who are, you know, the occupiers and and the people that um, uh, Haiti can its independence from went to uh, France, I uh, went to uh, Louisiana and uh, Maryland, Baltimore. And when they came here, they began to spread those rumors about Haitians, cannibalistic, people that kill, you know, the violence, because they had to justify slavery. And the fact that we have the only country in the world that fought the slave system successfully and created our own independence and gave citizenship to any black person in the world and fought for the independence of other countries. Just yesterday, a friend of mine was reminding me, who is Greek, was reminding me how Haiti was the first country that supported the independence of Greece and even gave coffee, you know, sold coffee in order to help them uh, for their independence. We all know about how we supported uh, South America, Simon Bolivar, and so that they can gain their independence. So therefore, I think we have to put the anti-Haitian in, in, that, in that perspective. Uh, we are for freedom. We really believe in human rights. This is not something we just talk about, but we, we, we act on it. And anyone who is against that, obviously will see us as an enemy. So when Haitians came in in the 1960s in New York City, they wanted to differentiate black Haitians from uh, mulattoes by saying, you know, they spoke French and they were, you know, if you were educated, you were better than the uh, refugees who were coming in. But uh, obviously uh, that didn't hold too long. And in uh, New York City in the 1960s and uh, 70s until the 1980s, Haitian immigrants also suffered a lot of prejudice and discrimination, uh, primarily during the AIDS crisis during the 1980s. If you all remember, I think one of the things we have to um, really focus on, it's okay to rec record, to write letters, to to um, meet with uh, our local ele elected officials, but we need to have the voice of the Haitians heard on the street. In 1990, when we, we block Brooklyn Bridge and we block traffic on Wall Street, that's when they began to realize that they should not continue to keep you know Haitians from donating blood. I think mobilization is very important in that process. The second thing also I, I think we have to remember, in the 1980s, Haitians did not have a voice. Like um, Sharon just mentioned, we had other people representing us in the political system. Major Owens, Juna Clark in, in the, on the East Coast, but today we have elected officials, Haitians are Americans who are representing us. And we are in some states that are critical for the elections. We are in Georgia, we are in Pennsylvania, obviously in New York, in Florida, and our vote counts. So therefore, I think we need to create a strategy to make sure that this is what happens, that pay attention to, to us. And the third thing also, I think it is important to understand. I remember when, uh, you know, during the uh, Munich World Cup. And then you have the Fujis and, and uh, you know, uh, he was wearing the uh, flag of the um, of Haiti at that time. This brought another narrative about Haiti. The, the, the narrative that came in was that Haitians are musicians. There's the uh, the sports uh, football players, the basketball players. Therefore, the minute they begin to integrate into the men stream and, and uh, companies can profit and can make money with them, then it's a different kind of narrative they want to, to uh, explain for Haiti. So we need to mobilize these people, right? 
the movie stars, the uh, sports, uh, uh, you know, players, the uh, people who are uh, influential in different fields that are Haitians, that have, you know, recognized themselves as Haitians, to come forward also. So that we don't only have um, friends talking for us. We have to own the process to change the narrative. The uh, I remember when um, in the nineteen eighties, when Haiti when Haitians were being singled out and kept, you know, they were being fired from jobs because of the AIDS crisis. They didn't have this kind of uh, uh, representative to talk on their behalf, but now we have these things, and as we are listening on the webinar now, we need to hold these people accountable. You know, you cannot be Haitian only when it's good and you claim to be Haitian. Wycliffe is an influential person in many ways. So I know he might make a statement, but he can do more than that. Various others can do more than that. So we need to really develop a strategy, a plan to make sure that can happen. The second thing I wanted to um, uh, mention in terms of um, understanding what's going on with the Haitians, we need allies. We have to understand the uh, blood libel that Trump is coming with. He has a history way back in Eastern Europe when the Jews were being accused of killing babies, drinking babies' blood, and that was the 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 terrain, the the kind of um, organized structure, so that they can have the programs later and keep. So what Trump is doing now is preparing the terrain. It's not so much about picking up Haitians and sending them back to Haiti. It's about mass killing that's going to happen. It's about genocide because we all know the, already know the relationship between the police and and uh, and black people in the United States. So no one is going to be listening to your story and say, okay, uh, kindly go to this uh, center so that they can deport you. They're going to be hounded like dogs. They're going to be killed. They're going to be, uh, you know, tortured. And one of the biggest things that's going to happen also, it's they're going to separate their families from them, you know? And at this time, no one is going to ask you for your papers. It's going to be a question of either you, you are black right, and you have an accent, therefore you are Haitian, you need to go. So I think we need to explain these things um, uh, at different level. Churches, we have a lot of Haitian American uh, churches in the United States, primarily on the East Coast. We know that also um, Haitians are, uh, wherever they are, they have churches. So we need to really work with those churches in, 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 at the, in those places. And then we need to have an agenda. Many of the uh, Haitian leaders, the elected officials, the actors, the prominent people, have kind of, um, I would say, a personal relationship with politicians. Meaning that, you know, they can call the politician, they can talk with the politician. You know, we all in New York know Hakim Jeffries. We know uh, Senator Schumer, but they're not, they're not our friends. They only meet with us because we represent a constituency that they need. So we need to leverage, leverage that in order for, for them to take a strong stand on this issue. In terms of academics, as academics, there are a lot of things we can do too. Because for example, in New York City, I'm just giving you an example. New York City has 6,000 Haitian American students in the CUNY system, City University of New York, that enroll every year. We represent a large part of the um, CUNY system. Now, it's, it's one thing for professors to put out a statement for Haitian Studies Association, for Haitian Studies Institute to put on those uh, statements out, but it's also incumbent on the universities also to put a statement to say, to say clearly that they don't support this kind of discrimination and, uh, and also fear mongering of Haitians. That also is very important. 
because everyone needs to participate in this process. Otherwise, what will happen is that, as usual, they, 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 we might feel alone, we will feel powerless, and also uh, it's like the world would abandon us because in the past that has happened. Even though we supported um, the liberation of South America, we, we armed uh, Simon Bolivar, the first conference that took place in South America, the first conference that took place in Panama, Haiti was not invited. Haiti was kept out. And those countries agreed to keep Haiti out. So therefore we need to make sure that these things don't happen again. So I would say, you know, we've come a long way. We shouldn't just totally, you know, be in despair, but we should not give up in terms of the mobilization that needs to happen in everywhere that we uh, Haitians are so that, uh, you know, we can bring the attention of public officials on what's, you know, how they have been, you know, treating Haitians. Wow. Dr. Perry, thank you so much. You, you said so much. Yeah. I need that we need to own the process, not just have people speak on our behalf, but actually take some sort of charge and have an agenda and try to mobilize people across communities, within our own communities yes. and elsewhere. Extremely important. I think, about it. Yeah. This point you made about, you know, uh, the right wingers yeah. preparing the terrain. That phrase is really jarring to me, yes. you know? Yes. You mentioned the programs, but at the same time, just at the Haitian Times, we're working on stories about um, survivors of the Trujillo massacre in 1937 in the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's 87 years ago. It's not that far off no. if you really think about it. Yeah. So I think I, I really thank you for bringing that perspective to us today because we've seen all the memes, people joking, it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, TikTok viral, all of this stuff, yeah. but the real potential impact that we're yeah, yeah. we're looking at. Yeah. And Marco, that's the other issue. Which I'm I appalled that people are joking. Even Haitians. Yeah, they are. Are joking about this because they don't understand. They don't really see the danger. You know, these days with uh, social media, TikTok, you can do a 10 seconds or 20 seconds and make things funny. But when they come for you, you know, it's not going to be funny. That's why we need to really educate our population not to internalize certain things that are against them and thinking that, you know, they will not affect them. Sure. And, and I think one of the weaknesses we have in the community sometimes People be uh, 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 you know become um, victims of their own issues that they have internalized as a joke, and not realizing the danger. Mm -hmm. So whoever can teach those Haitians, I, whenever I meet with Haitians or someone who makes a joke about the dogs and the cats, I said it might look as a joke for you now, but nice. they're talking about you, mm -hmm. and yeah. they're not joking. Because we've seen the history and the fact that one of the main issues that we are facing is that Haitians don't get a break. You don't get a break at home because the US government continues to support dictators, corrupt people, people are involved in drug trafficking. So there is no way you can find a respite in your own house. And now you are forced to leave the country. You mm -hmm. come here and you don't get a break. You know, this is this is very important. We have to really link the political situation in Haiti to what's going on now in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Because had we had a democratic uh, elect a democratically elected government, had people been able to stay home and go about their business, raise their family, many of them would not have been in Hawaii or in other parts of the Midwest or in the United States. Mm -hmm. So therefore there is a direct link. That's why when we raise this issue, we shouldn't forget the internal politics, what's going on in Haiti, and okay. how these leaders that we have in Haiti allowed that to happen. Can you, yeah, can you say that part in Creole? Yeah, or, one thing I want to, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, one thing I want to push what you just saying, 
I'm going to say the Creole because I was just doing my radio show because I broadcast mm. in my place. We have a show called Please the Bush every Saturday, 1.30 to 2, me and Pastor Fowl tell. I was just saying that. Some people take it as a joke, think it's funny. When they heard something about like eating dog, eating cat, everything like that, some of them may, may even think, and you think they can do it for real or they may do it for real. And I tell them, cut it off. Just close your mouth when you see those things come in because you turn, your, you turn against your own people. So you know it's not true. So, ça y est, toujours dit aux Haïtiens. Mm. Ben, on tente, on va dire qu'on s'a parlé, pas applaudi. Parce que, quand on a eu un peu de monde, mm. il y a tellement de travail chaque jour, il n'y a même pas de travail qui a fait pour nous. Il n'y a pas de travail qui a fait pour nous. Et c'est ça que je dis toujours dit aux Haïtiens. Parce que, il y a travail chaque jour, il n'y a pas de attention, il n'y a pas de temps, parfois, il y a un peu de mauvaise information. Je dis au conseil que les hommes ont connu les informations pour nous connaître si c'est vrai ou bien ils ont besoin informer ou bien former tête par yo relé yon nan moun yo connaît qui fait partie dans ça n'a pas réglé là parce que ça n'a moun qui fait groupe ça qui cap chercher défendre haïtien cap chercher moyen pour nous faire gouvernement bon ici comprendre que moun que yo pense nous y a nous pas ça son petit groupe très minime qu'il y a et me dit encore nous même nous pas besoin moun nous besoin moun qui pour supporter nous tant que nous qui venons bon ici, nous venons supporter nous, mais nous même tout, faut nous cap camper pour tête à nous tout, pour nous capables de camper avec eux, pour nous faire un seul. Même j'ai tout le monde dit, l'union fait la force, we can, together we can, we need to get together, we try to fight for us. We know we have to be our own. There are one lady there, Miss William, she stand for and on her side. Mm -hmm. Then again, you stand on our side, there are other people stand on our side. So we we just cannot sit down and let people fight for us. We need to fight. We we know how to fight. We fight before. Mm -hmm. okay. We need to fight it together. All right. So yeah. with that, let me bring on Gary and then um, President Williams. And Gary, excuse me. I can I say something here. I keep uh, getting kicked off. So oh. I, <laughs> I don't been on and off about five times. So I I don't know if it's my internet. But if I can go on as soon as possible, because I'm I'm getting kicked off and kicked back door, okay. and everybody is text. It's just go a lot going. Okay. <clears throat> Listen, I appreciate it, and thank you, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for allowing me to be in your circle. I'm here to let you know the NAACP is fighting for you and all of the black and brown community. Uh, a lot of times, you know, they can't tell if we Haitians or not. So an attack on one is an attack on all black and brown community. I want you to know, we are standing with you. I don't take a back seat to anything like this. I have been on the phone all morning. A lot's going on in the community. But let me share this with you all. I have been in touch with my family my cousin is the director of mental health up at Washington, D.C. And they, she called me crying because she wants to do something. We're going to put a counseling session together to help Haitians with all of this. Help you guys. And, and I need it because it's, it, this right now, what's going on, is so familiar. I've been in a 1968 riot. It was my family member they killed, which started the riot in 1968. So I could tell you, in my high school, I, we had to stay on one side of the hallway and the white stayed on the other side. I was friendly with both of them. So I was on both sides of the hall. But that didn't keep the riots from breaking in. I want you all to know that I, we all stand with you, folks across the country. I've had calls from as far as Maui, from Japan, China. Everybody is calling. Everybody is praying. Everybody here is calling me, asking me, what can we do to help? And I gotta say, I, I, I just don't know, but we can't let this go on. I have put out a um, all call community meeting tomorrow at seven. Uh, it's gonna hit the streets here in about 30 minutes when I'm done speaking here. And we're, are, we, I gotta get with everybody 
I want us to come together as one. Attack on one Haitian is attack on us all. So we are not going to be divided here. We are going to stand with you. I also was on a conference call with my state president because I uh, was supposed to be in Cleveland for the Ohio conference, but I, I asked for permission to be excused because there's business I need to handle here with you all. And, and let me share this. I am calling on our state representatives to come in here. I'm also calling it, I understand Trump is coming. At the same time, I want my national president of the NAACP to come down. I've already put that out to my president this morning. I am disturbed. My heart is broken. I want you guys to know that I love you all. We love you all. I want you to know that attack on you is attack on all of us. You are not standing by yourself. And I don't want you, listen, any type of bullying in schools, any type of discrimination, you any type of housing issues, any type of work issues, this is why the NAACP exists, is for you. You don't fight that those issues by yourself. Call my office. I'm going to give you the number before I hang up from here. You are not alone. Do not think that you are here to handle this alone because you are not. I am telling you right now, I was on the phone doing this. I had to walk away on the phone with Chief Elliott right now, keeping me posted as what's going on out here. Uh, uh, right now, tensions are high. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm going to say, you guys, please stay safe. I need you to stay in. I met with uh, uh, Governor DeWine's team yesterday, uh, the safety team. They came to my office yesterday and uh, we met and uh, they asked me, what do you think the problem is and what do we need help on? Uh, so they have established an uh, office here. This is what I want. There's going to be a driving, uh, a driving, um, project rolled out here in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm setting up a mental health post. I may ask Vallis if I can use his uh, office, uh, if I can use his, use this op there, you guys' office, so we can have a mental health evaluator. So they're, they're, I got a call today. They're coming in, and it's led by my family member. She's the director of mental health. And then we're going to have uh, we're looking into, I said, I want the, I want them to look into housing, housing for the Haitians. You're not to live in a house with lots of people and they charging you. That's against, that is against all policy. That is against the law. So I, I put that on the table. I want that looked at. You are not to be tolerated and presented with some mess like this. But if I don't know what's going on, I can help you. You have got to let me know what is going on. And you got to tell me that these are problems because I can deal with that. I, I have enough uh, uh, arms, long arms. My arms are long. So I, I could get help around the whole country. Trust me, the whole state of Ohio. So don't please don't think you alone. Valis, I want to get with you because I'm having a team of mental health professionals uh, it's being planned right now, coming in, because I heard you say that uh, the other day when I was there. Uh, we, we'll get counselors here. So no worries on that. Listen, any threat, any type of threat, I need, listen here. I need you to hear me clearly. Any threat whatsoever, I need you to call 911. Then you call me. Any issues. You understand? And I want to know how long they're taking to get to you. I do not want you to fear because trust and believe I'm working closely with the police department, with the state highway patrol. I'm working with uh, Governor DeWine's office. I am in work. Now that I know that Trump is trying to come here, I put in a call for, uh, okay, I put in the call for uh, our national president to come down as well, all right? I also have on the call, I want you guys to know, I have um, the Nation of Islam 
which they are here to protect us and they're here to definitely protect me from any type of danger and harm. They are on the webinar right now. And I want to say out loud how proud I am of the Nation of Islam stepping up with this thing. Okay? We are here. We're supporting you. Don't listen. Don't be afraid. Because that's they're that that's that's giving them what they want us to do. We're not doing that. We're here and we're not going nowhere. We stand together, not divided. So when Trump says he wants to take out, he going to come and clear out all the Haitians from Springfield, he doesn't know who's Haitian and who's not. What they going to do, break our doors down? No, that's unconstitutional. And I will make sure that constitution is followed. Trust and believe that. I, you know, I never thought that this whole thing would go viral. I, I, I didn't even know what that meant till I had a call this morning. What you mean? You know what I'm saying and what what the the uh, the, uh, uh, uh press conference is viral. And I'm telling you, people all over the world is praying. They are praying. Mm -hmm. Okay, believe me when I tell you, mm -hmm. they are praying. And prayer changes things. You know, we can't forget who sits high and looks low. We can't forget about it. God is our protector. He will take care of all of this. So those things that I have put in place are actually in being planned right now. All right? They being planned now. So I just want to to continue to tell uh to tell you guys listen you cannot hesitate to call me that's what we're here for mm -hmm. you you feel threatened someone says something anything housing we're looking into that I, like i said i don't need to go back over but i'm telling you there is work that is in place right now you mm -hmm. are not alone and let me end by apologizing to you for all that has happened, for all that has taken place. You are our people. We protect each other. This is a community of love. This is, com this is a community of love and a community of understanding. A community that believes in, in God, knowing that he is looking down and he's going to reveal all of this to us after a while. So my people, you my people, and we are here for you, my brothers and sisters. It's breaking my heart bad. It's breaking my heart down bad. But you don't be afraid to call the office. Okay. Call the office when there's an issue. I appreciate you. I love you. And thank you so much for this time. Um, I keep going in and out. I got to call and see what's going on with my internet. But uh, Mac, if you need me to speak any further, uh, just ring me up on my phone and I'll be speaking to you right away, okay? Okay, we'll do that, President Good, Williams. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You uh, know, I hope that, yeah, everyone feels the love coming yes, through. Yes, yeah. <inaudible> yeah. Ça, président William se dit là, vraiment, vraiment, me sent-il entré dans 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 son qui est un monde, un monde qui a fait um, tout genre de plaidoyer. Yes, plaidoyer ça y est pour ici dans Springfield pour montrer que nous tenons que vraiment pas pas seul. So, merci un peu, président Williams. <laughs> I, I want to say just one last thing, um, Valis, you are going to be put as of Monday on our executive committee. And we will be, someone from my office will be getting in touch with you. You Thank would you. be my eyes and ears on the ground for the Haitian community. And you would have an opportunity to bring, and I will go through it all with you. But this would be, you would be a point where any complaints, concerns come to you, you call me. Um, so we'll go through all of that. Let's just wait till some of this cool down. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm only waiting until Monday. All right. Okay. And I'll be in touch with you. Uh, God bless you all. Is there any questions for me?
We will at the end. We're also collecting any questions that um, people put in the comments or yeah. chats on, on Facebook, on the Facebook pages. So okay. we'll put them there at the end and, and hope to have a way to follow up with everyone. And we Absolutely. might do another one of these again, maybe yeah. do an update to yeah. make sure people's um, concerns are being addressed and that we're holding each other accountable. Yes. Like we were saying. So thank you again so much. I'm thank you. Up. Like switch over a little bit because I know we have this until seven and I just want to spend a little time on how we can get organized um not just right now to respond to the immediate yeah. need the immediate threat but um how we need to be thinking as a community um going forward through the election you know and even beyond so I'm gonna do that um, right now and ask Gary to come on to share with us some of the um the experiences he's had as a reporter as a journalist a former journalist with the new york times the sun sentinel my alma mater you know he's reported out of haiti so he's he knows haiti and haitians like you, like nobody's business <laughs> so and in fact that's our business this yes. is what we spend our time at the haitian times doing is keeping an eye on the community being the pulse of the community. Folks aren't always happy when we call them out, but that's our job. Yes. So Gary, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, that march going back to 1990 that Francois Pierre uh, mentioned and how that was an impactful moment for the community because it sounds a lot like what may need to happen here. And then from that immediate immediacy, talk about some of the work that you helped the NYPD um, have with through community affairs to help address the issues with police brutality after the whole um, Abner Louima situation. But just very briefly, please, before I get to some of our other folks. All right, thank you. I'll keep it brief, Mac. And I must say, I'm I'm really, uh, of course, I shouldn't be, but I'm really impressed about your leadership, the role that you've taken, and 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 for us being in Springfield in the first place, because it was her idea to, to anchor a democracy day in Springfield because we had been watching Springfield for quite some time and she felt it was appropriate. And here we are. Unfortunately, what we had planned did not materialize. I was supposed to be in Springfield in person, but at the last minute, heeding some uh, calls from folks, from friends, loved ones, I decided it was not a good idea for us to hold this, uh, well, collectively, obviously hold this in person because our point was not to be provocative. It was to be to listen to folks um, and uh, see what we can help as a, as a, as a uh, media. But let me just say this. I just learned today and Seth Curry announced that his mother is half Haitian. I mean, um, like, I, <laughs> I was like, okay, so this is, this is, I'll take that as a win, but you know the Haitian community now is going to some is going to have to make some tough choices, right? Because we have to decide what kind of community we want to be, who is going to be our allies, and are we ready to shed the I and embrace the we? You know, as uh, my friend uh, uh, Francois Pierre Louis mentioned earlier, we've come a long way. We have, uh, but we have a much longer way to go, so we can really fight. Uh, attacks like these. And believe me, when I tell you this, they will come back. You know, again, Francois Pierre will give us a history come, going back from Thomas Jefferson. And he says something that, you know, I would not repeat the whole thing, but he says, fancy that, the N word speaking French. So they saw us, French was the language of the elite, the educated, the cultured. And then you had black people speaking the language. So it was a put down. So from that to today, there's a history of it and it's not gonna end anytime soon. So you mentioned, Mac, the uh, the, bridge, the the protest across the Brooklyn Bridge. I will tell you what that impact had on me personally, professionally. One of the reasons why the New York Times felt that it needed to have a Haitian American reporter was because of that march, because the community's advocacy had been so under, overwhelmed the city that the New York Times missed it because they were wondering, how did we not know this is coming? 
And that was a wonderful, and I've told this story in public many times, that I owe my trajectory, my really, and when I think about it, my career was too fast, <laughs> you know, and but it was because of the Haitians, the, the activism that was going on. And the Haitian times was born out of that sentiment. I just felt that if going to the next level, we need to have a media that's sophisticated, that's sophisticated and able to, to, to bridge the, the gap between the Haitian community and the leaders, and they needed a voice for, for that conversation to happen. And so to me, that's an anecdote that tells you the power. But right now in New York City, we had a crossroad. Okay, we are trying to go it alone. We, in fact, we've been antagonistic towards Caribbeans in Brooklyn. And this is something that gives me a lot of pains and we need to address that immediately. We need to come together. And so this is essentially what I've been witnessing the last 30 years since I came back to New York, well, uh, 91, uh, to work at the New York Times. I've covered the growth of the community, its, it's wins and its challenges. Right now, we need to really come together. We need to have local organizations, strong ones. We need to have regional organizations and a national organizations that really come together. I mean, we've been hearing from the NAACP. It's one of the oldest civil rights organizations in the United States, but we need to have something like that as well. Maybe the choices that we may make, join with the NAACP or be separate but equal, I don't know. But it's not, <laughs> no pun intended with that one. But the bottom line is, you know, we're Black, we, 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 we're immigrants, but that's, the immigrant part is temporary because our children are, no, are not immigrants. They're children of immigrants. And in my case, I'm a one and a half generation. And so I'm a little bit more American than Haitian. It depends where I am. But the fact of the matter is we have to really start looking at inward and be honest with ourselves and get ready. Because it's, if we're not organized, nothing matters. So that's what I, that's the message that I want to part with tonight. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for sharing that. Um, we appreciate you and certainly the work that you've been doing with the um, Haitian American um, Indianapolis. So I'm getting the acronym wrong, but it's handy. It's, yeah, Haitian uh, Association of Indiana. They are on the call watching. Good okay. friends. Yeah, big shout they were out. gonna they were gonna drive to Springfield, but you know we told them no, we we're not gonna do it in person. But yeah, we are making great connections here in Indianapolis. I feel like they've embraced me like like I'm home, and I feel home. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you. There are some lessons and some resources they'd like to share with you, mm -hmm. um, and Philomen. So we'll be sharing those with you over the next few days and connecting you to all of these people who want to help like we've been so inundated with yeah. requests for how to help right do we send money what's an organization you know and unfortunately the community here is so nascent it's really you know embryonic yeah. but at the yeah. same time growing really really fast yes we're not able to say definitively you know here's what you need to do but again i hope that in a future conversation We'll, we'll be able to help guide people, provide that guidance. And certainly in between, yes. we'll report it out in the Haitian Times to keep you supported, not just today or next week, yeah. or if Donald Trump shows up, but throughout your your evolution here in in Ohio. Wow, and so the other thing do, certain thing coming now, we wasn't expect those things coming. Mm. We wasn't prepared for them. Mm. Yeah. We wasn't expect that. If yeah. you know something you expect, so you prepare for it. Mm -hmm. so it's just something that we learn it. We never know if those things will come in all the drama will come in about the ocean. Yeah. 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 But yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know one of the biggest issues is the mental health 
part. Yeah. Uh, we're all really concerned about how our children are yes. processing this yes. information. Mm -hmm. So I'd like Sophia Pierre-Luz to come on and talk about what some of her ideas are or what she's learned as um, ways to support the, the, the not just the, the physical health, we can protect ourselves by staying home. We, mm -hmm. we don't go to Walmart and whatnot, but what do you say to these kids who are going to school and being bullied? You know, who's uh they're afraid. Yeah, they're 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 yeah. afraid yeah. and they just feel like they're losing their sense of, of pride and belonging. How can we prioritize that and help those youngsters to process this moment, Sophia? Um, hello everyone and thank you um for this, because this is great. This is great information. I learned a lot from Mr. Pierre Louis and everyone else. Well, with the mental health issue, we're gonna cover not only the children, but the parents as well. Because in order for the children to be stable, also the parents need to have, uh, the mental health issues, should be, the mental health should be very good. So now um, in terms of mental health, um, our situation is that we Haitians, we don't believe in mental health. And usually when you talk to a Haitian, you tell them that, oh, you have to go see a counselor, therapy. They said, I'm not crazy. <laughs> it has nothing to do with you being crazy or not. You need mental health. Because sometimes um, your mental health, first of all, let me tell you about mental health. Mental health is something that affects you, affects your thinking, affects the, your social ability to function with other people. Um, it's emotional, it is psychological, and it's, it's I, I, I just said, social. So emotional is like, you, you, you didn't mute yourself. Sometimes you don't understand how you feel. With, like you feel kind of, I don't know why I feel like that today. I feel kind of, I don't want to talk to anyone. You feel sad. So that's emotional. So you have a psychological, like when it affects your mind, like you, you cannot function, you cannot think enough. Like you feel like, oh, I cannot, you have clarity to make decisions um, that's, that matters to you, that's affecting you psychologically. And also social, you, like you don't have a good relationship with your neighbors, with your family members, with your friends. You don't socialize with anyone. All these things affects your emotional health. So now um, in that affects also the children because we Haitian parents, we think that, oh, the children cannot feel anything. It's all only us. No, the children also the, go through emotional um, problems because they feel like, okay, I'm all alone. No one likes me and all these things, especially nowadays what we are facing right now in that situation in the school system and nation, nationwide when they're talking about what they just said. So now let's go into... Um, common, common, the common mental health conditions. So, so that sometimes you don't know what is mental health. We know when people said, "I'm not," uh, you're, you're depressed. Well, yeah, depression is a form of mental health. Feeling sad, like I just mentioned before, feeling hopeless, feeling loss of interest in activities. Sometimes watch your children. Sometimes they lock themselves in the room. They don't want to interact with other people. They don't want to do anything. They just stay in the room. I don't want to do anything, mom. I just, like I have my kids. Whenever I see them like that, I check up on them. Check up on your children. Try to interact with them. Try to ask them questions to understand exactly why are they not interacting with you. They're not playing. They're not listening to anything. So that's a form of depression. Anxiety also is when they like you have excessively you worry about everything, you panic, you have fear. Right now, currently, we are in the state of anxiety because so many of us are in Springfield or even in Columbus, everywhere. We are panicking. We have a fear like oh, what's gonna happen next? Are we gonna be um, attacked? Are we gonna lose our home? What's gonna happen to our children? Am I gonna be walking the street and someone's gonna shoot me? So that's anxiety. So that's part of mental health, um, bipolar depression. Some people are bipolar, they have moon swings. Sometimes you see them all up, 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 up. And then the next minute you see them all blowing down. I just feel like talking. And tomorrow they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I wanna do something. And then like, they say, leave me alone, leave me alone. That's, they can have a moon swings. So that's another form of mental health. You have another, uh, you have a few other ones too that I don't have the time to go into it. But now, what are we gonna do about this type of, situation. If you find yourself feeling sad, feeling depressed, feeling like I have anxiety, now what are, can you do? 
And also the most, most important thing, why do I feel like that? How do I get mental health? Or like, is it something that it's biological? Yes, mental health can be biological. Sometimes you can have a parent that maybe has some kind of mental issue in the past that may be affecting you, that affect your genetic, your chemistry in your body, and also your, your hormone changes. People go into monopause that can affect your mental, like there's a biological, biological change. Also your life experiences can be another form of, of, of things that can affect your mental health, like trauma, you know, like a lot of Haitian, they are traumatized. The children are traumatized. You know, living in Haiti, seeing the shootings, the gun, the kidnapping, that's, tra that's traumatic. Also, you come to America, that's culture shock, another trauma. You didn't expect to be in America paying all these bills. You didn't expect to be treated unfairly. You didn't expect to, to people for people to diminish you. So that's a form of trauma. And also abuse, mental abuse, physical, physical abuse is another form of life experience that can affect your mental health. And also major life changes is you just get a divorce that can affect you as well. Family history, we talk about that. And also social environment. If you not don't have enough support in your environment, in your relationship, in your home, with your children, with your spouse, that also that social environment in your neighbors, in your community, it affects you. So what can you do about this? Okay. So you have one thing that I know that helps me because we all face that issue. I'm not going to say that, oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not. I don't get, I don't, I'm not, I don't face mental health. Yes, we do. You know, dealing with community all the time, being a pastor, being a mother, a father, but any walks of life affect your mental health. So what can we do? Exercise is great. Go for a walk, you know, you know, do some breathing exercises. Also, you can change the way you eat nutrition, the way you can, uh, can actually help you with your mental health. Not only that too, sleeping, um, well, I don't sleep enough. So that's something that also I have to start. I know I have to do it. So sometimes we work so much. I'm sure Venus also stay up to check what's going on. I cannot sleep. And in the situation that we are facing, dealing with the community also keep you awake at night because you don't know how can I deal with that? How can I answer that question? What can I do next? Like, with community leaders, whether you're pastor, you're businessman, or you, uh, what, whoever you are, if, if you are in the role of a leadership, you are affected by that and your lack of sleep. So we need to try to work a sleep schedule so we can sleep enough. And also, um, um, what can I do? Stress management also, relaxation technique, I mentioned that, and also time management. Let's manage our time um, properly. Now, in terms of the children, whatever I just, everything that I just said, affects our children as well. Because you know what, even though they're five years old, 10 years old, they have feelings, they have emotions, and we should uh, uh, attack that as well, talk to them and allow them to go for a walk, make them do some exercise, them breathe, deep breathing um, exercises, talk to them, like try to relate with them, try to understand them. If they said something to you, don't quickly to judge them, jump on them or punish them. Try to understand why did they say that? Why did they act like that? And ask them questions about school. How are you feeling in school? Do you like your school? Um, what did they say to you? Do you feel comfortable? How's your teacher teaching you? And teach your children that you are involved in their lives. I know America makes us go, like we don't have the time for ourselves, but create time for your kids. Talk to them about how is your school today and get involved in their life. Go to sporting, sporting activities with them. And um, in the school, make sure you stay on top of their schoolwork and talk to their teachers, the counselor, and also make sure that you are advocate for your children and also your neighbor's children. Because I can, I can tell you an example. And the other day, my daughter, um, she was at work. She texted me, she said, mom, don't pick me up. I want a friend to pick me up. And I know that kid is in my neighborhood because he wants to pick up some food um, on, on my, on, after work. I said, okay, he can pick you up. So um, when I was waiting and he, she texted me a while and I, I said, where are you? He said, oh, I'm coming. So I said, okay. Then I texted, she texted me again. And she said, mom, we were pulled over by a cop. Um, can you please come? Well, luckily um, I was, not four minutes away from their location, we share location, and also it is good to share location with your children. You get uh, you get to see where they at, what they do, as, as well as myself. So we in the house, we share location with each other. They know my every move. I know their every move. So now I look at the location. I said, I'm four minutes away. I'm here. So I drove up there um, to meet them. So I saw about five cops pulled up and. 
two 16 year old in a car. So I said to them, excuse me, officer, I'm the mother. And he was like, well, um, your daughter is fine. I said, okay, what about his, um, her friend? Well, ma'am, you know, she was, I said, okay, um, what's the situation? Well, it seems like he picked her up and they were driving and the um, his headlight was out. He didn't know. So now they flashed him. So our neighborhood can be dark and there's a little hill. So in his mind, he was like, nine o'clock at night. He said, it's dark, I cannot see. He said, I was trying to find me a safe place to stay, to stop. So now they thought that he was running. They thought that he was like, like doing something illegal. So they call five um, um, cops cars to follow them. So now when he finally pulled down, so they came out guns, they pulled a gun on them in the car. And um, and he and they told me that they said that okay, they asked them to come out. So they told my daughter, you can stay here. I said, I have to call my mom. He said, okay, we'll, we'll stay here in the car. So they took him out of the car, handcuffed him, put him in the back of the seat of the car, okay, and left my daughter in the car. And I said, Where is I don't want to mention that, where is your friend? And she was uh, in the back of the police car. I said to the cops, did you even call the parents? Well, man, we have to figure. I said, no, he's a 16 year old. You pull a gun, which my daughter told me, and he, they actually agreed that they pull a gun. I said, you pull a gun on two 16 year old. Well, we thought that they were running. I said, okay, I understand that you can take that. But when you pull them, you, when you they stop, you come came over and you watch them. You see this, so you're supposed to have a conversation with them and understand and try to, oh no, they were going back and forth with me. So knowing myself, I was pulling every cards, every name that I know in Columbus, Ohio, okay, that I'm gonna go so and so, I'm gonna call so, so they were like, okay, ma'am, calm down, calm down. I said, I'm not moving here, not until I see this kid in his car going home. So I stayed there. So I advocate for a child in my neighborhood that I know. So you need to start doing that also, not only, be, be, uh, be, um, try to protect your own children, but other children need to be protected as well. So now he had to call his surgeon to come. So now with the surgeon come, what's going on? And I was like, on it, on it. So finally, what they said, I, as he was talking to me, they released him out of the car and they were very nice. Now they're laughing, man, everything is okay. I said, it's not okay. So now to prove you the, pro the point that you must keep your eyes open uh, regarding your children and your neighbors because these things are real and they all and they, that's can affect that can also can affect your children and also the other day like i think i'm gonna close on right now i think mark told me to, to to tell you that story one of the um people that i work with uh, not work with but they usually call me even though they live in springfield there's a situation they usually reach out to me so when he she called me on friday she said madam sophia um, I keep calling my daughter's school and they not every time I call the call drop. So my daughter did not want did not go to school and I don't want her to go to school. And then one thing she doesn't feel comfortable going to going to school anymore. I said, what's going on? And she said to me, Well, she um she went to school and the children were asking her about eating dogs and cats. So she's not comfortable about that. I told her, okay, so call again and call me back. She called again, the call dropped again. I said, well, give me the phone number of the school and the name of your child and I'll call for, yourself, for you. She was like, okay. So I called the first ring, the, the school picked up the phone. <laughs> I was like, hello? I said, hi, I'm calling on behalf of so-and-so and I told them and they were like, okay, ma'am, I'm gonna transfer you to um, attendance. I got the attendance. I said, well, so-and-so is not in school today. This is, um." Of this, she said, okay, is she okay? I said, is she sick? I said, no, she's not sick. Of what's going on right now, um, she's, she feels very uncomfortable because your students are bothering her, bullying her about eating cats and dogs. Oh, I said, well, I, I, I would suggest that you, the school start giving an education to the students in the school so that they don't feel like that because it's not right. Okay, I'll make another, I'll, I'll make another of it, thank you. And then she hung up. So we have to keep our eyes open. We have to advocate. We have to stay strong together in unity for the change to happen in our community, not only in Springfield, throughout the nation. Thank you. Sophia, thank you so much for that. Applaudissements for the question of Madame Sa avec Petitly. 
but we know that's not the case for everyone. Yeah. Some people don't even know to call you or have that that um access to you. So we hope that we can get to a point where calls like that don't even have to be made because the school will be aware of situations that mm -hmm. pose a threat to students, not just physically, but mentally as well, all of this uh, bullying going on. And I'm really glad that President Williams mentioned they're working on all these various task forces and, and, and work streams to try to get things done. I want to use that, you know, that last story to segue into the experiences um, that folks in other places have had um, and to use that as energy to move forward in terms of um, what we need to do with civic engagement, um, civic education, and how we need to partner more with people like the NAACP, the local police, you know, they should all have had training around yeah. dealing with, with, with children or even recognizing that just because, even recognizing how old a child is. I've heard from cops or folks who say, oh, I didn't know so-and-so was that age, mm -hmm. right? Like, we just look older because of the uh, criminalization of Black children, um, but the way the system works in this country. So I'd really like um, Representative Joseph and also um, Dr. Austin, if you're on JP, I'm not sure if we had to drop, to talk about how we can support our community um, moving forward in this manner so that we're in a better place, you know, maybe not six months from now, a year from now, but certainly <laughs> two years from now, because this story she relayed sounded so much like the stories we heard in New York around stop and frisk under Rudy Giuliani, whom everyone knows now what his role has been um, in the Republican Party. And so it just feels like a lot of things we thought we had made progress on and put to bed in one part of the country, now we have to apply them or because our new people and new communities are dealing with those same issues now. So speak to us, um, Representative Joseph. Thank you so much for joining us today. Talk a little bit about your activism and how we really need to take this to a more national collective level um, with our organizing and educating the community. Absolutely. Thank you so much for organizing this forum. I'm sorry it didn't get to be in person, um, but I, I think that just allowed us to have this opportunity um, to address things from a larger perspective because the entire community is impacted. And let me clear about what I say when I say the community, not just the Haitian American diaspora, the entire Haitian diaspora, and then everybody who's a human being who believes that people should act with integrity. Um, so a couple of things are going on. So I wanna address um, some things that I heard from the comments that I want people to be cognizant of. Even with that last story about the, the child who's having some trouble in schools, there are lots of ways that our elected officials, whether you have a Haitian elected or not. So in, in, in Haitian meccas like um, Miami, where I represent in Florida and New York, we have lots of Haitian elected officials that we can go to, but I need the community to understand what resources are there. So usually um, your local schools, there'll be a school board or a school township, whatever that local government structure is, they can help address some of those things. So it's not just leaving a message for um, the person who answered the phone, but speaking to a counselor, speaking to the principal, speaking to the school district about some of these issues so we can collectively see how to address them. And I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge that the community in Ohio, specifically the local elected officials, the, the people who were on the press conference, I'm um, talking about what they were doing with their community, as well as the governor, have expressed a real desire to address real solutions for real problems. That's a, and, and that's regardless of political party. That is in stark contrast to people at the top of a particular um, ticket 
um, who are using this literally as a political weapon and as a political game. And I want people to understand the difference because at the end of the day, we need to be aware of who is fighting for us and who is fighting against us, who is working with us towards solutions and who is trying to demonize and vilify us for their own political game. Um, I want the entire community to understand and see very clearly what's happening politically. What's happening politically is um, a particular politician and his sidekick want to use our community, particularly immigrants, and what better target than a Black immigrants, to use us as a scapegoat to distract from their failures, their policy failures. If you look at some of the issues that are happening in Springfield that are highlighted by Springfield, you hear affordable housing issues, you hear questions about um, education, how to address a new population, um, businesses that are struggling to fill jobs. This is not unique to that population. It's literally happening all around the country, whether it's an immigrant population or not. What you will not hear from those people who are not actually interested in solutions are cognitive, co concrete ways to address those problems. Why are those landlords raising the rents? Why are those landlords taking advantage of people? It's not that the population is driving those rents up, it's that somebody is making a decision to raise those rents. That's happening where you have immigrants and where you don't have immigrants. And what we're seeing is if we really wanna deep down, get deep down into those issues, which a lot of politicians, if they're not actually interested in solving issues, they're not going to do. They rather distract you, have you talking about cats and dogs because they don't have an actual solution. So I want, our entire community and the entire world to be very clear about what's going on. This is a political game. They like the memes, they like all of this stuff because as long as you're talking about that, you're not gonna be talking about the ways that the same issues that are impacting the Haitian community are impacting the, the, the non-Haitian community, the non-immigrant community all around the country. And what we need are people who are focused on actually solving those issues and addressing those issues in a meaningful way. Now, what does that mean for our community? Um, tomorrow, the National Haitian Elected Officials Organization, the, the network of all the Haitian American elected officials throughout the United States are gonna be putting our heads together to talk about different ways to address it. I know that there's gonna be a couple of pastors from my area who are going to be heading to Ohio um, this week to address and, and just get an assessment of the needs of the community to see how we can best support. And that's what our community does. We're here to help. We're not here to just come in and be the Calvary, but we do, the, the benefit of this moment in time in history is we're not the same community we were in the 90s. We're not the same community we were in the 60s, 70s, or any time thereafter. We have people in places, whether you're talking about Steph Curry in terms of, um, that was mentioned, <laughs> um, of celebrities, right? Wyclefs and all that stuff. So there's, there's a national awareness of Haitian culture, particularly if you're in an area where there are Haitians, but there's also a competence, um, not just politically, but in our professional class to go in and address some of these things. So it's time that we put our heads together, and come up with some solutions because this is not unique to Springfield um, with the, with the humanitarian, parole, humanitarian parole program, better known as the Biden program, you know, we have different pockets around the country, some of which have no Haitian American elected officials, but they are, they do have other American, other American elected officials who care about the Haitian community and who care about the well-being of their communities. I want people to be very clear about the role that immigrants play in the United States, because the right wing establishment, and I'm not just talking about the politicians, but literally there are organizations who have invested to the tune of 11 to $14 million in trying to vilify immigrants with words like illegals and um, border crisis just to get people riled up because it's a game for them. And I want us to know that immigrants, I want everybody to know that immigrants add to the fabric of these societies, these communities and their contributions, whether you're talking about filling jobs, creating businesses and all the ways that keep this economy afloat and government entities will tell you that. So I'll just stop talking. Um, I'm here to help. Um, all of us are here to help. So as we identify the needs and the best way to do that in a safe manner, um, and also in interacting with some of the elected officials um, that are in Ohio to help with those solutions. We are here to be a support. Representative Joseph, thank you so much for that. Um, there's just, I feel 
good and bad hearing you speak because yes, I'm happy there are plans being made and we're going to put things into action, but it also means we have a lot of work to do at the Haitian Times. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm putting out the call now to anyone who is interested in contributing to our coverage, you know, not just this week or next week, like I said, next year, to please reach out, stay in touch with us to see how you can help us keep the next phase, if you will, in the in the limelight so that people like Viles, like Philomen, like the, the, the woman Sophia was talking about, know that they have a community that is dedicated to them and really wants um, to help them. I'm um, gonna close it out, but I wanted to check in because we are at time, right at time actually. Can I add one more thing? Sure, sure. Okay, so as we as a community collectively think about our next steps, I want us to recognize that it's not just us fighting our battle. We heard from the NAACP, the oldest and boldest civil rights organization in the United States, of which I'm a long lifetime member, but there are lots of other people within our networks. Every elected official that's represented by you needs to condemn those remarks and they need to do so publicly. As you're planning to vote, it's not about which party, but it's about which candidate. We will not forget which candidate said what about us. And this is the time for us to make sure that our, our registration, our activism and our votes reflect that. So I'm just putting that out there. As we go forward, think about our larger network and what that looks like in terms of an action step, both in terms of politicians and corporations that are retweeting things that are harmful to our communities. It be that's it. Okay. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> so just before we close it out, you know, Viles, this is we're in your home today. We're in your space. You were so gracious to um allow us to allow the Haitian Times to to come in. And, and do this with you. I'd like you to have the last word, but um, I do see um, Dr. Austin is on the call. Um, if he's able to be promoted to speaker, I'm sorry, the other Dr. Austin, <laughs> JP Austin, Cheryl, I don't know if you're able to promote him um, to speaker at the moment because um, he is the chair of the foundation, the Haitian American Foundation for Democracy, also known as have D. And right now, this is the group that has really been reaching out and trying to figure out how to engage with people across the community. And so I know that there's a lot of momentum and energy with the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus, um, taking place this week where he was able to be in the room and attend. So I would love for him to be able to add any uh, thoughts or remarks from Thank that you. section to show um, just the level of, of might we have behind us at this moment um, before before we wrap it up, Dr. Austin. Hi, thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? I had to get my daughter to help me with the electronics. I think someone's asked one, but I did. Classic. But, <laughs> I, but I just want to say, I mean, this has been inhumane, horrific, racist, these attacks are, are unacceptable. And we have to, uh, to stand with the people of Springfield, Ohio, with our brothers and sisters. But I think in life, we also need to use these things as opportunities, is my belief. I'm a, I'm a cancer uh, doctor, I, chief of radiation oncology at the Miami VA. But my, my, in my, what my heart, what I want to do with my life, I guess, what I've done with my life is how to help others, how to make the world a better place. And I think we have an opportunity in the Haitian American community, if we can rally that community and come together to empower the community to make a, a difference. And you're right, I'm at the, I'm at the CBC Congressional Black Congress um, this weekend, and you realize what happens is that unless you come together for political power, everything else is, is wishful thinking. I've been, I've been doing, I've been fundraising and for 40 years, my wife and I, um, all over this country. 
and for the last 20 years in South Florida. I used to be Florida finance chair for the DNC. Um, I used to be, I, I was, I've always been very engaged. My hope now is that we can use this opportunity for the Haitian diaspora writ large to come together, find a way to agree on some basic things, come together to gain political power. If you have no power, and I've met with politicians for 40 years, you talk about it's a wish list that you have. They don't laugh at you in your face, but they rarely deliver. But if you come together and gain power, believe me, they will listen and they will come to you and help find thing, resolutions to help your community. And this is true locally, wherever you are. And somebody mentioned places like Georgia, Pennsylvania, Florida, where these places matter, for example, in national elections, right? And we, are, we have significant number of voters in those places. So as, as Representative Joseph said, we have to go vote. Last stop comment is that we formed something called the Haitian American Foundation for Democracy a couple of years ago. And the whole goal of the foundation is to bring the community together, to empower the community, so that we can then go to the world to make demands for our community. So please, we have a website, the Haitian American Foundation for Democracy or HAVD.org. You could learn about, we have a board member, for example, Pat, a former ambassador to South Africa, Patrick Gaspar, who I'm sure is on the call as actually listening. It's what all we want to do is empower the Haitian American community so that when things like this happen, we can all come together en masse, in force, and push back on things, this kind of crap. So please go to our website, Haitian American Foundation for Democracy. Help us in this, in this fight, in this putting our, our, unless we do that, these things are gonna to continue to happen and we're gonna to continue to, to, to be at the, at the behest of these other people. So thank you so much for giving us the few minutes and thank you for coming into the fight with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Austin, for those uplifting words. I think um, I wanna check in with my friends in Springfield, I have um, Philomene is back, so, <laughs> you know, just, I'd like to leave it to you guys to um, wrap up for us. I'll, I'll do a quick summary of what I heard here today for those who joined, um, you know, late or who may not have time to watch the entire two hour session. And then yeah, please, if you could just um, wrap up for us. The, the majority of things, I know I jotted down a few things. And so please pay attention. I've got, um, you know, from all our speakers, I have about 10 things. I'm gonna go through them really quickly. Um, so racism is deep. You're not alone here in Springfield in a small town or in a large city. It's historical, it's been part of America's history for the longest time. Just like you said, it goes back to Jefferson, okay? <laughs> and these N-words who speak French. That's how deep it, it goes, okay? Secondly, now's the time to organize and mobilize. We need to have alliances within our community yeah. and outside of our community with people at the national, state, um, local levels, everywhere. And um, to be most effective with our demands, like Dr. Austin said, we have to have some sort of wish list that we can put together to agree on. This has been a running theme that we've like heard and seen in our coverage of the community over the years at the Haitian Times, people telling us, well, what do you Haitians want? Where's your agenda and whatnot, right? 
And I think right now, facing this moment, going into this election where, um, you know, the certain people are preparing the terrain to dehumanize us and vilify us, now's the, the clarion call, I think, if at any point to really come together and figure out what that wish list is going to be. And so that's that's the challenge, that's the assignment, that's what we'll be paying attention to over the next few months and, and years as that develops, okay? And um, I'm really, really happy to hear that the NAACP in Springfield is, you know, ready to move. <laughs> yes. They've got you on a board doing more work now. Yes. I, I hope that comes with funding as well so that work can be sustained. One thing, um, uh -huh. don't forget what she was going to say. So, Ms. Yeah. Denise, I remember I called her last month for some issue mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. And she was sick. She walked through, one to three to my office, sit down, talk to me to get the the Report. issue resolved. Yes. Yeah. So Report. that's the kind of leadership and on the ground support we need. We also need advocacy at the mm -hmm. at the state and the um, national international level. So you know we have to stay focused. We have to take care of the housing issue, drivers ed, you know, uh, immigration issues that may be um, causing some things. We also have to hold our elected representatives accountable, right? Haitian or not, they're elected to do a job. They work for us. They're public servants. So I really want the community to keep that in mind so we're not afraid. Même je ne peux pas aller quand nous, qu'est-ce que côté en Haïti, ou qu'est-ce que nous passons, ok. Même pas à la vie, c'est nous faire l'idée de droit, discipline, point six. Exactly. Même pas à la vie. Donc nous pas besoin, nous pas besoin peur, you know, c'est pour nous venir, pas arrêter à souffrir en silence. Don't suffer in, in silence is the overall takeaway um, from there. And last but not least, as Sophia said, you know, keep your eyes open on each other. Look out for your neighbor. Yes. Look out for your friends. Mm -hmm. Look out for the kids. Look out for your leaders. Look out for your non-leaders, ordinary people. You know, no one is above the other in any your, way. Okay? Yes. So if that means someone's pulling over teenagers and we need to escalate that to the NAACP, that's what exactly. we have to do. So on police can be yes. on la rue, on toujours pour attention. Même yes. Même si c'est pour moi ici, si c'est pour accident pour attention, mm -hmm. si c'est pour moi ici, parce que quand il y a là, nous, la patrie en danger, c'est le quoi suivre pour l'autre. Mm. Wow. So, Philomen, thank you so much for joining me today. You guys mm -hmm. really welcomed us into your home, and I'm so happy that we've had this moment together, even though we couldn't have the town hall style meeting that we had planned. So, with that, I'm gonna hand over back to you, Viles, to take us out with any final words you'd like to uh, to include for bon, folks. Bon, même avant, mm -hmm. je vais vous donner un peu de travail qui va faire là. Et thank you à retourner back to you. Et je vais vous dire welcome à toi, ou bien si c'est ça, je vais vous thank you so much for you. Oh, thank for you. For your support and your team. No, no, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Hopefully everyone, that reminds me though, I have to put in a shameless plug to support <laughs> the work of the Haitian Times please visit our website, HaitianTimes.com. Donate to us, follow us on socials. You can donate there too. You know, we've been doing this now for 25 years. We're actually hitting our 25th year anniversary That's great. in October. That's great. And I feel like we are at a moment, the new generation, new blood, you know, yes. that are welcome. And so we're really hoping to have the means to be able to do this important work. So thank you everyone who came in. Apologies for any technical miscommunications we might have had with the cancellation, not canceled, it's back on, it's virtual. If you are able to make it, I appreciate you so much. Keep following us and we'll do this again at a later time. Viles. Thank you everybody. And I, I heard a lot and I have hope in everything that you say. Mm -hmm. um, we are here and um, you know already the problem. We have expertise everywhere, Haitian police, um, Representative Joseph and uh, mm -hmm. our friend from the Black Caucus and uh, the professor, we have all the resources that we need to keep moving forward and I am so happy for that. And thank you so much for choosing here to do this wonderful work. And uh, we can, we'll continue to work with, with together. And uh, I believe that uh, in the future, we won't let only the foreigners take care of our folks here. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, we will open driving classes, ESL class, and have people from all work of life or from all states in the USA mm -hmm. to come down in Springfield to say that this is the, the way that we can support and we'll be glad to welcome you. We are doing a wonderful job here despite of all has been happening. That's true. And we keep faith that we have you as our friends who, who will continue to support our effort here. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. We love you so much and we'll continue to, to, to work together. I see no va pour compte nous, nous tout le monde qui campe de de nous, c'est ensemble pour nous travailler. Parce que nous va pour compte nous. Nous plein monde qui campe de de nous, c'est mettre tête nous ensemble pour nous avancer. Exactly. L'union fait la force, on fait la réalité. Thank you. Bonne nuit tout le monde. Merci, c'est un plaisir. Passez bon week-end.